football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in. Winning Cures Everything is the Wednesday, November 16th edition of the show. Excuse me. It is the Thursday, November 17th edition of the show. It was supposed to be the Wednesday, November 16th. And uh, and it is what it is. I did not get to do a Wednesday show. Had some things happen yesterday that were not ideal. But we're here, and we're ready to rock and roll. We're going to try two shows again today. But this one, of course, is the college football under-the-radar picks and predictions against the spread for week number 12. We still got a couple more weeks of this regular season left. We got things that we need to do. Uh, let me go ahead and tell you first. This show is powered by BetUS. It is America's premier online sports book. You need to go and check it out. Fantastic things that are going on over there. So definitely, definitely give BetUS.com a visit. Uh, if you look in the description, there will be a $50 free play that you can get for signing up over there. So go ahead and make sure that you take advantage of that. Uh, read all the terms and conditions, all that kind of mess. But regardless, it's still a really, really fantastic bonus that they're offering. Um, I host the Bet US College Football Show. All of my official plays are over there. They are not going to be right here. Just letting you know. These are what the way that I would go on these games. These are my leans, etc. Uh, if I think I'm going to make a play on it, I will tell you. But... At this is just what the numbers say, what I think based on trends, everything else, right? Situations, all that. The way that I would bet it if I were going to bet it. But these are the games that have not been discussed on the BetUS College Football Show, but we do that every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Make sure that you are subscribed over there if you would so kindly. All right, let's dive into this. we we got to knock these games out. First game on the docket. Florida heads to Nashville to take on Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt is a 14-point home underdog with a total set at 57.5. Latest numbers at BetUS. Going to pull it up on the screen here so that we can look at what is actually happening. Uh, the trends on here, Florida 4-1 and one against the spread in their last five against Vanderbilt. Florida is 5-2 and two against the spread in their last seven games. So Billy Napier, of course, doing good things right now. They are 3-8 and eight against the spread in their last 11 on the road. Vanderbilt, 7-2, and two, excuse me, 7-22 and 22 <laughs> in their last 29 games at home. Uh, they are 1-5 against the spread against teams with a winning record, and they are 9-2 and two against the spread in their last 11 in November. So that is certainly something to pay attention to. They seem to be better developed towards the end of the season. You start looking at these numbers. Uh, my number has it, and this is based on the last five weeks. I'm going to say that multiple times for the video clips, but... These stats are over the last five weeks. The Florida defense is not good against the pass. Number 116 PPA per pass, number 92 as far as passing success rate. Um, Vandy's offense can throw the ball a little bit. Number 50 in pass success, number 10 in passing explosiveness, while Florida's defense is number 112 in giving up explosive passes. So uh, something to certainly pay attention to there, uh, but you you move down to the other side, right? And this is where I'm I'm a little concerned for Vanderbilt. Rushing explosiveness for Florida is number five on offense. Uh, Vandy's defense is number 94. PPA per rush, 16 for Florida. Uh, it's number 72 for Vandy's defense. I feel like Vandy can get run over here. Uh, they have they had some success, obviously, against Vanderbilt. I mean, against uh, Kentucky last week. But Florida is showing a different gear right now. They are really, really rolling with this offense. They're not going to throw it a whole lot. They're over the past five weeks. They're only throwing the ball 44% of the time. This looks like a mismatch where Florida just has the bigger dudes. They are probably going to be able to run them over. I know that the line has come down. A lot of money has come in on Vanderbilt uh, to be able to cover this. I kind of like Florida in this spot. I understand that they've got Florida State coming up next. But I'm, I'm going to roll with Florida to cover the 14 here uh, because I think that it, they're just going to run the ball. They're, they're not going to put themselves at a lot of risk. They've got more athletes. I, I trust Florida to be able to get this done. So give me the Gators to cover the 14 on the road. Next game up, we have got Wisconsin heading to Nebraska. And Nebraska is a 10.5-point home underdog here. The total sits at 39.5. This one, 12 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN. And let's go on and pull up the stats here while I'm reading off the trends. Uh, you look at the trends here, and let's see. 
We have got da, 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 the road team is 5-0 and oh against the spread in the last five meetings. That certainly bodes well for Wisconsin. Uh, you look at the Badgers. They are 5-2 and two against the spread against teams with a losing record. They are 5-2 and two against the spread in their last seven road games against a team with a losing home record. However, they are 1-5 and five against the spread in their last six road games. Uh, so how do you break all that down? Nebraska, on the other hand, uh, they are 4-1-1 one one against the spread in their last six in November. Uh, they are 2-5 and five against the spread in their last seven home games. So definitely not great. They're 3-7-1 and one against the spread in their last 11 games overall, so that is certainly not great. Uh, my my number has it based on the last five weeks of stats. Uh, Wisconsin minus fifteen point six four. I don't know that I trust them to be able to to win by you know fifteen by more than two touchdowns, but I could certainly see them winning by two touchdowns. Uh, this you're not going to see a ton of passing. I don't believe from Wisconsin in this, and that is because Nebraska is number one twenty one in rushing success rate allowed. Uh, Wisconsin is not great on offense at that number 85, but they are number 46 in PPA per rush. And Nebraska does a pretty good job of limiting explosive running plays, but part of that is because teams can get five yards whenever they need to against them. So you're still going to have Graham Mertz trying to throw the ball here and there, but I don't think you're going to see that much happening. Uh, I don't think you're going to see a bunch of turnovers here, um, at least not from Wisconsin. This seems like a fairly easy cover. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ride with the Badgers here to be able to get this done because I don't think that this Nebraska offense, even if Casey Thompson is back, is going to be able to do anything against this Wisconsin defense. Uh, Wisconsin number 17 PPA per rush defense. They are number 23 PPA per pass as far as explosive, or excuse me, as a success rate. Uh, Wisconsin number 13 in defensive success rate allowed over the past five weeks. And yeah, I'm absolutely going to be all in on that. So. Um, yeah, this is, this makes a, a whole lot of sense to me, uh, that Wisconsin would be able to get this done. And the hook may scare some people off. Doesn't scare me. Give me, give me the Badgers to cover the 10 and a half here. I, uh, starting off with two favorites. I'm sure this is going to go well, right? All right. Kansas state heads to West Virginia this weekend. And this spread is only seven and a half. West Virginia, a seven and a half point dog. Of course, things not looking great for Neil Brown there. Uh, the total is 54 and a half, 2 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN+. Plus. All right, so let's let's discuss uh, what is actually happening as far as trends. Uh, Shane Lyons, of course, was fired last week. He was just about the only barrier between uh, the people with the money that would like to have Neil Brown out and, uh, and Neil Brown himself. It, you gotta you gotta win some of these games. I don't know that they're gonna be able to do this. However, you look at the trends. Kansas State is one and four against the spread in the last five against West Virginia. Um, the under, by the way, eight and two in the last ten meetings. But that's it's certainly a a Chris Kleiman and Bill Snyder thing. Uh, and of course, West Virginia had those high flying offenses. That that explains that trend quite a bit. The Wildcats are four and zero against the spread. Their last four against a team with a losing record. They are five and one against the spread versus a team with a losing record overall. Uh, they're seven three and one against the spread in their last eleven. I mean, this is Kansas State just covers numbers. They just do. Uh, you look at West Virginia though. Mountaineers one and five against the spread in their last six after a spread win. They are twelve four and one against the spread in their last seventeen home games though. So of course they got that win over Oklahoma that was. Very much unexpected, um, but you that win over Oklahoma, like, does it make you feel a little bit better? Like, the Mountaineers are one and five against the spread. Their last six following a straight up win as well as a spread win, so uh, not great. Uh, another trend here: Mountaineers four and one against the spread against a team with a winning record. And this line smells fluky. Uh, it's it, something's fishy about this because it shouldn't be this low. Uh, and of course, you've got the hook there as well. So, of course, everybody's thinking, eh, you know, maybe maybe I need to bet West Virginia here. My number, based on the last five weeks, uh, is Kansas State minus 16.71. I mean, more than two touchdowns. I think that they can manhandle West Virginia's defense. Um, you look at the, the rush rate and the pass rate over the past five weeks, and Kansas State is not running the ball all that much. Uh, Deuce Vaughn? is being used a little more, like, I guess, in the passing game. Uh, you look at their passing explosiveness, it's number eight in the country. Their PPA per pass is number three. Passing success rate is number four. And they are throwing the ball 
more than 50% of the time, 51.5% of the time. Like, that's their pass rate right now. You look at that West Virginia defense, number 93 in rushing success rate allowed. They are number 90 in passing success rate allowed. That defense is not good. So long as you do not beat yourself, I have a feeling that Kansas State will be able to maul them in the trenches. Uh, you look at uh, uh, stuff rate, that's that's where it gets a little tricky for me because West Virginia is number 64 on defense and Kansas State is number 103 over the past five weeks. So that offensive line hasn't been great, but I think this is kind of a get-right spot for Kansas State. Uh, they have to have this. It looks like they're in the driver's seat to be the other participant in the Big 12 title game. I I look at West Virginia's offense and, of course, the, the new quarterback that came in last week, um, and his name escapes me right now, but... Regardless, he provided a little bit of life and changed up how that offense plays. I think now that there is film on him, I think Kansas State will be able to uh, devise a game plan to be able to get a stop here. I I like Kansas State. I'm going to take the Wildcats here uh, to be able to get the cover because, I mean, the numbers just say that they're going to be able to put up a bunch of points, I think. And I don't know that West Virginia can. And so... That is the way that I'm looking at this one. Give me Kansas State minus seven and a half. Three straight favorites. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. We are moving right along. Um, Houston at East Carolina. East Carolina is a six point favorite with a total of 67 and a half. This one, of course, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time as well on ESPN. Let's talk about some trends. Let's go on and pull up the stats there. Let's discuss the trends. The So we're not worried about head-to-head here because uh, these two don't play all that often. Uh, the Pirates are 6-1-1 one, and one against the spread in their last eight following a straight-up loss. They are, uh, let's see, 13-4-1 and one against the spread against a team with a winning record. That is what Houston has, of course. Um, yeah, this one's going to be weird. East Carolina 7-3 and three against the spread in their last 10 at home. But I think that's kind of baked into this number. Houston... Not not a lot of trends here. Three and seven against the spread their last ten against the team with a winning record. Um, they are two and five against the spread in their last seven conference games. They're two and six against the spread in their last eight overall. Like this is not not a good spot for Houston. However, I think the number is incorrect here because I think it should be a little bit closer. This feels very coin flippy. Uh, Houston's defense is not great, so I think the Holt Nailers is going to be able to do uh, quite a bit of stuff here. Uh, you look at at what they're doing as far as passing the ball. East Carolina, uh, passing a little less than 50% of the time. But, man, that Houston defense cannot stop a pass. I mean, they are just not great at it. Uh, Number 127 in passing success allowed over the past five weeks. PPA per pass is number 129 for that Houston defense. However, you look just overall, Houston's offense number two in the country in offensive PPA per drive. Uh, They are number 128 on defensive PPA per drive. East Carolina... Kind of the same situation. Uh, Not as good on offense. Number 22 in offensive PPA per drive. And on defense, number 93. So Houston's going to be able to score on East Carolina's defense. And at the same time, East Carolina's going to be able to score on Houston's defense. I mean, look at those Houston offensive numbers. I mean, it is crazy. Just crazy. If they can get any kind of a stop, then you're going to be able to do something. Um, But you look at, like, points per scoring opportunity. Yeah, that's not good, right? Uh, number 120 in defensive scoring, uh, excuse me, defensive points per scoring opportunity. East Carolina is only number 50, though. So East Carolina kind of stalls themselves out every now and then. I feel like this is a field goal game. My number has it, East Carolina, by a little less than a point based on the last five weeks of data. Yeah, I don't like Dana Holgerson uh, a whole lot, but especially because he, he cost me that cover against SMU. Gracious, that's, that's the only reason. That's it. Otherwise, I love the guy. Uh, but I will take him here. Hey, give me Houston plus the six. Um, it just feels like too many points here. Too many points here. On the other side, we're going to hit BC at Notre Dame, NC State, Louisville, Miami, Clemson, and Western Kentucky at Auburn. Let's check out some things you should know about. College football is back, and Bet US TV has you covered. Every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we've got expert game analysis to help you make informed decisions before kickoff, only on the Bet US TV College Football Channel. 
Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit betustv.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports Show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right, let me go ahead and tell you first off, go to winningcureseverything.com, enter into the contest there, the Pick'em Contest. Uh, there's also a link in the description here, very easy to do, uh, but the winner each week gets a $25 Amazon gift card. So if you have not already done that, and of course, there may be some other things from BetUS as well, but make sure and enter in there. Uh, if you have not heard from me and you have won one of the contests, tell me what week and, of course, let me know exactly what your name was on there and what email you want that gift card sent to. I have reached out to quite a few people. I've had some emails bounce back, etc. Hit me up on Twitter, at GaryWCE, and let's knock that thing out. I want to get you guys paid off. I mean, what are we talking about? Uh, it's getting close to Christmas time. You could be using that $25 gift card. All right. Uh, along with that, the Valtimeri Surf Company. Fantastic clothing apparel. Uh, these guys are awesome. They've got a great line going with College Town Surf Company shirts. It's, it's cool. At one, the fabric is awesome. The material is like super, super comfortable. The designs are really cool too. Go to valtimerysurfco.com and use the promo code Gary10, and that will get you 10% off of your order. So go and check them out. Fantastic guys. I love what they're doing over there. Go and check it. All right, we're moving along. Boston College heads to Notre Dame, and Notre Dame is a 21-point favorite with a total of 42 and a half. I mean, what are we talking about here? Uh, just a super low total to be favored by three touchdowns. Just nuts. And, and we saw what Notre Dame did just last week against Navy. They get up big, and then they kind of sit on it, and Navy's able to squash them. Now, Boston College's defense is not going to be able to do that, but regardless, uh, let's talk about some of the trends here. Uh, Boston College is 5-2 and two against the spread of their last seven in Notre Dame. Uh, the road team, however, in this matchup is 6-2 and two against the spread in the last eight meetings. So something to pay attention to there. Uh, Boston College, 2-5 and five against the spread against a team with a winning record. They are 4-11 and 11 against the spread in their last 15 non-conference games, and they're 3-9 and nine against the spread in their last 12 games overall. It seems like BC is getting a little bit healthy. They're getting some guys back. Uh, just, you know, maybe. Uh, Notre Dame just wins and covers against ACC teams. They are 7-0 and oh against the spread in their last seven against the ACC. And, and... Notre Dame, of course, a different coach, et cetera, but the trends are they are 14-3-1 against the spread in their last 18 in November. Uh, you look at some of the other things here, Notre Dame also 2-5 and five against the spread their last seven games at home. It's because the number gets a little bit inflated, and I feel like it might be a little bit inflated here, although the data would show uh, over the past five weeks, I've got Notre Dame by 2086 some things changed for Boston College last week. A new quarterback played. Uh, the offense actually looked competent. Defense able to get a couple of stops, etc. I don't think that this Boston College defense is going to really be able to slow down Notre Dame a whole lot. Uh, but when you look, over the past five weeks, BC number 44 in rushing success rate allowed. Notre Dame is number 29. Notre Dame is not explosive on the ground either, which is one of the biggest weaknesses for Boston College. Notre Dame number 107 in rushing explosiveness. Boston College, number 108 on defense. Uh, you start looking at PPA per pass, all that. Like, Notre Dame only throws the ball 36% of the time over the past five weeks. Um, the passing success rate, like, number 78 for Notre Dame's offense, number 103 for Boston College's defense. Like, there's not a huge advantage here. Um, but you look at, like, the defensive numbers. Like, Notre Dame is going to be able to shut down this passing game because it, Boston College is throwing the ball 70% of the time almost. Like, it, it's pretty nuts. Uh, and that's the one thing that Notre Dame does really, really well. They're number 10 in passing success rate allowed, at number 9 in PPA per pass. Here is where it could get a little tricky. Passing explosiveness, of course, Zay Flowers. We all know what's going on there. Uh, 
Boston College's offense is number seven in passing explosiveness. Notre Dame's defense number 81. So they can give up some pretty big plays. Uh, and that's how I think BC is going to be able to stay in this is a couple of chunk plays here and there. You look at the BC offense, and they are not going to run the ball very much. Uh, so all these numbers in the green that look really good for Notre Dame on that left side of your screen, uh, it's not really going to matter. They're running the ball less than 30% of the time. And so something to pay attention to with that, of course. Uh, this PPA margin, like the defense uh, for Notre Dame, number 11 PPA per drive on defense, but they're only number 75 PPA per drive on offense. I I think BC stays in this ballgame. I think they find a way to stay in this thing. Uh, at the 21 just feels like it's a little too much. Even though these numbers right here tell me that, I think Notre Dame can get up big and then give up a few plays to where they stay, like BC stays in this thing. Don't forget, Notre Dame's got USC next week. Are they really all that worried about Boston College? I think they may just try and run out the clock here. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. But give me give me Boston College plus the 21. Uh, I like I like what they're doing. I like what they're doing right now. I, I don't think Jeff Halfley is a bad coach. And also, I don't think Notre Dame really cares all that much about covering this spread against BC. So, uh, so yeah, give me BC with, you know, a total of 42 and a half and a spread of 21. That's insane. That's just stupid. So, all right, moving right along, NC State heads to Louisville, and Louisville is favored by four points here. Total is 44 and a half. It's 3.30 p.m. Eastern time on the ACC Network. Let's pull up these numbers. Let's take a look at what we got going on here. Uh, based on the last five weeks, uh, my number has NC State minus 13, which was mind-blowing. But regardless, you know, here we are. This is, this is the way it goes, I guess. Uh, you look at the the head to head. The favorite is four and one against the spread in the last five meetings, but there's no real trend other than that. Um, NC State is one and six against the spread their last seven overall. They are one and six against the spread their last seven conference games. They are eight twenty and one against the spread in their last twenty nine road games. And I think all of that is baked into this line. Louisville four and zero oh against the spread their last four at home. Their their defense has been absolutely lights out, absolutely awesome. So I. I was uh, excited about what they're doing. Um, yeah, I mean, this is awesome. So, da, da, da. there we go. Make sure we answer that, of course. I I look at these numbers now. And, oh, Cardinals, by the way, 5-2 and two against the spread in their last seven home games against a team with a winning record, which is what NC State has. Uh, this quarterback stuff has really hurt. NC State's offense. Uh, they can't run the ball, but we've been talking about that all year. The number 80 in rushing success rate over the last five weeks. Number 104 in PPA per rush. And this Louisville defense, number 16 in PPA per rush, and number 22 in rushing explosiveness allowed. Uh, the PPA per pass. Like, uh, NC State's not going to be able to throw the ball on this Louisville defense either. But when you look at Louisville maybe trying to run the ball, that's going to be an issue because NC State's defensive line and their front seven are not going to allow that to happen. They're number five in PPA per rush on defense. NC State is. They're number nine in rushing success rate allowed. They're number five in offensive line yards allowed, number three in stuff rate. So I don't know that you're going to be able to get Malik Cunningham, if he's healthy, et cetera, uh, out of the pocket. I don't think you're going to be able to get like a ton of uh, chunk plays out of this. The issue for NC State is the secondary, right? Uh, number 115 PPA per pass. Uh, number 120 passing explosiveness allowed, number 83 passing success rate. The biggest thing that Louisville's got here is number 18 in passing explosiveness on offense over the past five weeks. This could be maybe interesting as far as like interceptions because NC State, uh, they are intercepting 4.64% of the passes thrown against them over the past five weeks. Louisville uh, is throwing an interception on 2.73% of their passes. So... Something to look at. Uh, maybe maybe we look at turnover margin, et cetera, um, which is kind of crazy. Louisville does a really good job of like taking the ball away. They're number one in takeaways per game uh, on defense, but they're number 82 in giving it away. So that's why you've got a turnover margin of four because they average getting like a turnover margin of 1.1 per game. Um, but you look at what NC State's doing. They're number 43 in giveaways per game, so they don't really give the ball away much. And they're number 28 in takeaways per game. So something to pay attention to. Neither one is very good as far as penalties are concerned, et cetera, but uh, it is what it is. I, I look at this, and a lot of people on Louisville right now, and I 
while I do think that this defense is really, really good, this feels like it could come down to a field goal. So if I'm getting more than a field goal here, I'm going to take NC State plus the four. Uh, I like Dave Doran. Um, his name has come up for several other jobs. So I'm, I think he could be coaching for a different job, but we'll we'll see. I mean, they've been through so much this year with the the quarterback changes, et cetera. So yeah, uh, give me give me NC State plus the four on that one. Moving right along, Miami heads to Clemson, and this one is interesting. Um, if only because Clemson or Miami actually got back on track a little bit with they went over Georgia Tech last week. Now some of that had to do with the Georgia Tech quarterback, but regardless, Clemson is a let's see. 19 and a half point favorite, latest number at Bet US. It's 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN. Let's go and pull up that number here. And, of course, the numbers, like the advanced analytics, have loved Miami all year. Uh, and it's partially because you can't really predict turnovers, right? You can't really bake it into a number, so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, it trends here, it, Miami is 1 and 6 against the spread of their last 7 against Clemson. Uh, you look at Miami just overall, 1-5 and five against the spread in their last six conference games. Of course, that one was last week against Georgia Tech. They're 1-8 and eight against the spread in their last nine games overall. Definitely not good. Uh, you look at Clemson, 8-2 um, and two against the spread in the last 10 conference games. They are 8-3 and three against the spread in their last 11 in November. This is when they kind of ramp up, and they you, you start maybe going, okay, like a, maybe, maybe a playoff team, maybe. Uh, you know, we'll have to see. You look at Clemson's numbers on offense over the past five weeks, and they cannot throw the ball. But part of that issue is that they are not throwing it very often. 40% of the time, they're number 109 in pass rate in the country over the past five weeks. They are number 125 in PPA per pass. They are number 108 in passing success rate, number 124 in passing explosiveness. So all of that is stuff that, you know, Miami is pretty good at. Uh, they're number 15 in PPA per pass allowed, number 26 in passing success rate allowed. You look at the rushing rate, and yeah, Clemson running the ball nearly 60% of the time. They are number 71 in PPA per rush, so you're not you're not getting a pun, like a ton of points from them. Rushing success rate is number 23 for Miami. It's number 77 on defense. Uh, rushing explosiveness, you don't have a ton of explosiveness coming from Clemson right now, but you know, you look at something interesting like stuff rate where you can actually get, you know, a stop behind the line of scrimmage, et cetera. Uh, yeah, Miami number 39 on defense in rushing stuff rate uh, allowed. And for, excuse me, on Clemson, it's uh, it's number 14 in stuff rate allowed. For Miami's defense, it's number 39 in stuff rate. So, you know, standard downs, eh, we'll, we'll see what ends up happening there. Uh, as far as Miami's offense, not great at throwing the ball, not great at running the ball. But if you just look overall, like they're number 80 in offensive PPA per drive. And Clemson's defense is number 57 in defensive PPA per drive. Clemson's offense, number 114 in PPA per drive. Miami's defense has actually been number 31 in PPA per drive over the last five weeks. My number has it, Clemson, minus 11.75. Like, give me give me Miami to cover the 19 and a half. Like, I, I, I think that there is a world where Miami actually doesn't turn the ball over, and I don't care if Tyler Van Dyke's playing, whatever. I, you, Clemson's not going to throw on Miami because they just don't do it. Like, I just don't see a world where they try and do that um, because I, I think that, I, that I think that's the weakness, even though the numbers look pretty good. I think that's the weakness of Miami's team is that secondary. I, I just don't think that they got the dudes there right now. But I don't think they're going to they're gonna try and do that. And if they do try and run the ball, I mean, you're talking about running clock, et cetera. You're talking about uh, 19 and a half, and it's a, a pretty low point total, uh, which I didn't write down, but regardless. Um, let's see if I can find a, a point total on this. Because I think I think if I look at this, it'll be in like the, the low 40s. Yeah, 46 and a half. All right, so you're talking about three touchdown spread with about 46 points. Yeah, give me Miami. Nobody wants to bet on Miami, right? But I, I will I will take the Hurricanes to cover 19 and a half. I still think Clemson wins the game, obviously. But, yeah, I, I think Miami can cover this. Uh, this line might be a little bit inflated because it's at Clemson, right? All right, moving along. This one's uh, gotten a lot of questions. A lot of questions for this one. 
Western Kentucky at Auburn, and Auburn is a five and a half point favorite. The total sits at fifty three and a half. This thing was up at like seven and a half, eight. Got bet way, way, way down. I mean, just a, a lot down, right? So let's pull up the stats. You're gonna. This is gonna blow your mind. Absolutely blow your mind on this. <sighs> Auburn a five and a half point favorite with a total of fifty three and a half. Of course, those latest numbers come from BetUS. My numbers over the past five weeks have Western Kentucky favored by 16. That's nuts. And it's only it's only that spot. And I don't have talent put into this particular metric here. So this one's a little hard to gauge. But, man, I did, I, it blew my mind. Uh, Western Kentucky 7-0 against the spread in their last seven games in November. Western Kentucky is seven and one against the spread against a team with a losing record. They are twenty and eight against the number in their last twenty eight games overall. Uh, however, Western Kentucky is one and six against the spread in their last seven against the SEC. Auburn, on the other hand, zero oh and six against the spread in their last six non conference games. They are one and four against the spread in their last five against Conference USA. They are two and six against the spread in their last eight home games. Ugh. What Western Kentucky has done this year has been incredibly surprising to me because they lost the offensive coordinator. They lost a ton of their pass catchers. Bailey Zapp, uh, Zappy, whatever you want to call him, is uh, is now playing in the NFL. Like, they lost a bunch of dudes. And yet this offense has continued with a 26-year-old offensive coordinator and a Division II transfer from North Florida, Austin Reed. They've just been clicking. Just absolutely clicking. And the biggest thing to me is that they got the defense fixed. This defense was bad last year, and yet now this defense is, over the past five weeks, number eight in defensive PPA per drive. Now, part of that might be the fact that they are playing uh, the number 125 strength of schedule. Auburn has played the number four strength of schedule. So there, there's something to that, obviously. But regardless, even against air, if you are number eight in defensive PPA per drive, that's pretty awesome. They're number 39 in defensive success rate allowed. The issue there is that Western Kentucky is number 58 in rushing success rate allowed. Yeah, that could be a problem. Um, forget the rushing success allowed for Auburn. Or not allowed. The rushing success by Auburn's offense is number 87. But they're number 37 PPA per rush. Number 7 in rush rate. They run the ball over 65% of the time. And they are number nine in rushing explosiveness. Western Kentucky is going to see a different level of athlete this week. And don't get me wrong. It's not like this is the most talented roster in the SEC by any stretch of the imagination. But what you've got here is an Auburn team that is fired up. They are hyped. This is the last home game for Cornell Williams to be the head coach because they will almost certainly hire somebody other than him uh, once this whole thing gets wrapped up. But they showed out for him against Texas A&M last week. And I think they're going to do it again this week. Like, it seems like there is a lot of enthusiasm around that program. Yeah, the number says that the wrong team is favored by a lot. I get that. But I think these numbers are flawed big time. I'm going to ride Auburn to cover the five and a half here. Uh, I just, I, I think that they are going to be able to run the ball uh, almost at will on this Western Kentucky defense. And Western Kentucky's offense is going to be able to score on this defense. Don't get me wrong. Uh, let's pull up that thing one more time uh, just so you guys can see it. But uh, all of these numbers, again, from Auburn are against SEC competition. I mean, it's the number four strength of schedule in the country. And, and while this is... Uh, somewhat opponent adjusted, I don't know that you can do enough of an adjustment on it to be able to figure out exactly where these two mesh. So, yeah, give me Auburn to cover five and a half. I think the line is going the wrong way. I think people's numbers are a little bit skewed. I don't think Western Kentucky has the dudes to be able to keep up with a highly enthusiastic Auburn uh, football team right now. So, yeah, I'll take Auburn to cover as a five and a half point favorite. Uh, on the other side, we got Iowa, Minnesota, of course, Florida, Rosedale. We got uh, Tennessee, South Carolina. We got Syracuse, Wake Forest. And we'll close with UAB at LSU. Let's check out some things you should know about. 
Follow the show on Twitter at Winning Cures. And you can follow Gary at Gary WCE. You can also follow on Facebook. Got your own podcast or web show? Looking to start one? Or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. If you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. Subscribe on YouTube to get not only full Winning Cures Everything shows, but individual segments and other goodies as well. We're over 6,000 subscribers, and our goal by the end of the year is 7,500. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com, and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now, back to the show. All right, enter the picks contest. <laughs> Click the link in the description uh, and go ahead and make sure that you have got your picks in. Of course, $25 Amazon gift card up for grabs every single week. Uh, we are still going to run this thing all the way through championship week, and, and then we might do a bowl contest. So we, we will figure this out as we go along. But, yeah, next two weekends, $25 Amazon gift card up for grabs. Make sure that you enter in the contest over at winningcureseverything.com. Also, uh, my I, I need some feedback from you guys. You can toss it in the comments, toss it in the chat, whatever, or hit me up on Twitter at GaryWCE. Uh, I'm giving out my college basketball picks again this year. Uh, I'm hitting, you know, nearly 55% over the past five years combined. I started off pretty well this year. I'm at uh, I'm 12 and 6 against the number right now. Uh, I would love for you guys to let me know if you want me to go back and do videos like I did last year, uh, just the really quick two minute videos and toss them on the website or toss them on uh, Winning Cures Everything, or if I should just put them out on Twitter and then go from there. Like, what, what do you guys want? What would make the most sense? Um, yeah, I, I try and do you know a quick two minute video, toss them up on Twitter. I think last year, uh, but then I started putting them on YouTube as well. Numbers did really well. You guys seem to enjoy it. Let me know if that's what you would like. I know this is a college football channel, a college football show, uh, but I really enjoy betting on college basketball, and I've done pretty well at it. And I know that some of you really like to tell my picks. So let me know what you think about that. All right, now Iowa at Minnesota. Very interesting game. Of course, uh, best trophy in all of football. I mean, it's just absolutely phenomenal. Um, Minnesota's favored by two and a half yeah, at, at home. Uh, the total is 32 and a half on this. Latest numbers at BetUS. It's 4 p.m. Eastern time on Fox. And that's interesting, right? Uh, I mean, it's a, a mid-afternoon, like, primetime spot. Uh, I don't know that either of these teams really belongs in that kind of a spot. But regardless, here we are. Moving into the numbers here, uh, my numbers have Minnesota favored by 5.72. Uh, Iowa is 5-0-1 oh, against the spread in their last five against Minnesota. Minnesota would love to be able to get a win over Iowa here. Um, I, I, the Hawkeyes are 5-0-1 oh, against the spread. We'll say that. <laughs> we'll say that. Uh, Iowa is 4-1 and one against the spread in their last five overall. They have finally found some semblance of life on offense. Uh, they are 12 and four. Uh, nope, that's the wrong number. That's the wrong number. Excuse me. They're all right. They're five and two against the spread against a team with a winning record. Um, they are six, two and one against the spread in their last nine road games against a team with a winning record. That's there's something to be said about that. Kirk Ferentz knows what he's doing. Minnesota five and zero oh against the spread in their last five against a, a winning road team. Um, the Golden Gophers are seven and one against the spread in their last eight uh, home games. That's certainly something there. And they are 8-3 and three against the spread in their last 11 following a spread win. This team is maybe getting back right at the exact right time, I think you could say. Uh, I'm, very, I'm very curious about watching this ballgame. Very, very curious. All right, let's dive into the numbers here. Minnesota no longer throwing the ball uh, very much. They're throwing the ball 30% of the time. They are relying heavily on Mo Ibrahim, big time. Uh, running the ball, Minnesota's offense... Number 32 in PPA per rush. Uh, they are number 30 in rushing success rate, and they are running the ball at a 70% clip. It is insane. Uh, number 12 in stuff rate allowed. Number 36 in offensive line yards. They're not super explosive, but that's because they have been able to run on basically everybody. Iowa's defense, however, uh, probably not going to allow that to happen very much. They are number 24 in rushing success rate allowed. They are number 3 in PPA per rush on defense. Uh, stuff rate is number 32. Standard down PPA number 7 uh, for Iowa's defense. 
and it's number 48 for that Minnesota offense. So Minnesota, if they are to get behind the chains here, they could be in big trouble because uh, their passing down success rate is number 67. Iowa's defense is number three. This Iowa defense is absurd. It's number two in the country in defensive PPA per drive. That is just nuts how good this defense and special teams are, and it's really, really hard to find a predictive metric that will help with that, right? And so, yeah, I'm I'm very, very curious about this one. Uh, let's look at the Iowa offense, which, by the way, is number 118 PPA per drive on, on the Iowa offense here. Uh, the Minnesota defense is number 25 in success rate allowed overall, number 35 uh, passing success allowed, number 27 rushing success allowed. So, at the same time, like... They're, they're number 42 in PPA per rush, so I was not really going to be able to, to run the ball a ton, I don't believe. Um, but then as far as like passing the ball, Iowa has not been good at passing the ball over the past five weeks. Hey, you look at these numbers, which, by the way, these numbers are over the past five weeks. Number 121 PPA per pass, number 104 passing success rate, and that's actually up from where it was earlier in the year. Uh, I, I know that Iowa has been great on the road. I know that they have been playing much better lately. But Minnesota seems to pull out these games every now and then, uh, especially at home under P.J. Fleck. It's like they set their eyes on something and and they find a way to get it done. And I think they're going to do the same, the same thing here. Um, I'll take Minnesota to cover this two and a half here. Uh, I, think, I think they're getting healthier. And if they do that, then they are going to be in a prime spot to be able to win this ball game. Iowa, again, special teams. Defense. Nobody talks about Phil Parker. They should. Um, Minnesota minus two and a half is the way that I'm going to lean on this one. So give me them gophers. I like it. Uh, as far as the total, I mean, I can't bet under 32 and a half. I'd, I'd, get, give me, I'd probably have to roll. Uh, I'd probably have to ride with the over, but regardless. Tennessee at South Carolina. This one's going to be. Interesting to see what Josh Heupel decides he wants to do on offense. Uh, Tennessee is favored by 22 on the road with a total of 66.5. So I guess they are expecting South Carolina to put up some points, but I would not imagine that it's very many because, uh, man, they just looked awful against Florida last week, and I think Tennessee is significantly better than Florida. So looking at the numbers here, my number on this is Tennessee minus 23.49. So that is better than 22. Uh, and probably close to 24, I guess. Uh, the Tennessee defense not great against the pass. I guess if Spencer Rattler was going to have an opportunity, it would be against the secondary. Uh, you kind of run into some issues, though, with that because I think that defensive line is going to try their best to get after him. At the, the South Carolina's offense is number 114 in havoc rate allowed over the past five weeks. The Tennessee defense is only number 99 in havoc rate. But, man, you know Tim Banks likes to bring those guys. So, if anybody was going to be able to get after him, I would imagine it would probably be Tennessee's defensive line and those linebackers. Uh, as far as, you know, stopping the run, Tennessee's uh, running game, as far as the defense is concerned, is uh, pretty good. Number 32 PPA per rush. Uh, number 18 in offensive line yards allowed. Number 25 in stuff rate. That South Carolina offense has just almost completely fallen apart without Marshawn Lloyd. Now, I think that he might be back this week, but... I mean, nothing is confirmed right now, and I just, I don't know what to make of it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm looking it up right now to see if there's been an update this morning, and I don't see, let's see, South Carolina. Yeah, Marshawn Lloyd, uh, he last practiced on, like, November 9th. Like, it's a bruised quad. Maybe he plays. It's, it's, it says game time decision. If he doesn't play, they're in some serious trouble. And it's really crazy to think like a running back means that much to an offense. But regardless, uh, the Tennessee offense, uh, yeah. Here, here's what you're going to get, okay? You're going to get a whole lot of running the ball, which will mean that South Carolina is going to have to bring those safeties up. And when they do, Tennessee is going to hit them over the top over and over and over again. Tennessee is number seven in turnover margin, as you see right there. And South Carolina, number 113. Uh, South Carolina's number 125 in giveaways per game. 
Tennessee number 16. Tennessee does not turn the ball over. They don't beat themselves. South Carolina absolutely does. 22 is just not enough here. Uh, Tennessee knows that they have to win big to be able to get to the playoff, and and I think they're going to do that. Uh, I know that this is at South Carolina. I get it. It's a um, it's a 7 p.m. Eastern game. You know, it, it, I think the fans are going to be hyped, but one big play from Tennessee's offense, and that'll probably take those guys out of it, especially early. And I think that's what's going to happen here. I just I, this, what Hinton Hooker is doing, by the way. Um, they're only number 55 in passing explosiveness over the past five weeks, but a lot of that has been skewed because, man, did Georgia shut them down. I don't think South Carolina can shut them down. I really don't. So I I think because these numbers are based on the last five weeks, obviously it looks a little a little weird, but, uh, but man, like it's, it's kind of nuts to think about. South Carolina, uh, number 98 PPA per drive over the last five weeks. Uh, their offense is number 59. Uh, the Tennessee team is number 25. Uh, offensive PPA per drive, number 61. Defensive PPA per drive, it, you would think it'd be like a little bit closer, but because of the explosive play uh, possibilities from Tennessee, you know I've got to take the volunteers. I, I understand that it's one point over a key number of 21 here. I don't care. I, I think they are going to blow them out of the water, give me Tennessee to cover 22. Um, yeah, a lot of favorites. A lot of, I, I just I hate. I hate taking so many favorites, but regardless, it is what it is. We got two more to hit. Syracuse at Wake Forest. Wake Forest is favored by 10 here. Um, let me write this time down. Make sure I've got the, the thing so that we can do the chapters on the YouTube. You guys know how it is. Wake Forest favored by 10 at home against the Orange. 56 and a half is the total. This one's 8 p.m. Eastern time on the ACC network. Let's go on and pull up the numbers here. And I've got it right around there, nine and a half, based on the last five weeks of data. Um, looking at the trends here, it, Syracuse six and two against the spread the last eight, following a double-digit loss at home, <laughs> which I'm sure has happened more than they would like to admit. They are two and five against the spread against a winning team. They are one and four against the spread their last five, following a spread loss. They are, uh, let's see, zero oh and five against the spread following a straight-up loss. Um, they're 0-5 against the spread in the last five in November. I mean, they have just kind of completely fallen off. However, against Wake Forest, Syracuse is 8-3 and against the spread in the last 11 meetings. Remember, this one came down to a last-second touchdown uh, in the Dome last year by Wake Forest. Wake Forest, if you look at them, they are 5-2 and against the spread the last seven following a spread loss. But... Here's the issue. They are 1-5 against the spread in their last six home games against a team with a winning road record. Syracuse does, in fact, have a winning road record. It's kind of surprising, I guess. But regardless, uh, this this Syracuse team has kind of, kind of fallen off a little bit, and a big part of that is their rush rate here. Uh, teams are running the ball on them like over 60% of the time, and it's because that defensive line is just weakened right now. Uh, they've... There's not as much depth there. Um, that's been like their their main go to, and maybe the reason why the defense uh, has been so good as far as the secondary is concerned is because teams are only throwing the ball on them 36 percent of the time. That is number three in the country. Like it's the third lowest in the country. It's just insane. So you're not having to worry about a whole lot of explosiveness, et cetera. Well, what does that mean when you've got a team that's coming in that's going to throw the ball 60 percent of the time, right? Wake Forest throws the ball nearly 60% of the time. The number 24 PPA per pass, number 18 pass success rate. Yeah, it's going to be an issue. Uh, Wake Forest does not run the football. Uh, they're number 113 in rush rate right now, number 127 PPA per rush, number 108 rushing success rate. They're not explosive running it. Uh, they've just kind of gone away from it for whatever reason. When you look on defense for Wake Forest, uh, they are really good at, at stopping the run. Syracuse, that was their bread and butter. That was what they were doing. Robert and I had that thing rolling. And, you know, Sean Tucker, while a great back, uh, hasn't exactly been fully healthy, I don't believe. And so, yeah, well, what you're getting here is, you know, a Wake Forest defense that's number 45 in offensive line yards allowed, number 20 in stuff rate. Syracuse is number 128 on offense in stuff rate allowed. Syracuse's offense over the past five weeks is number 130 in standard downs PPA, 
And I think Wake Forest is going to be able to handle that. Um, this offense wants to get back on track for Wake. Like, they they have not played well. Uh, they have already gone under their season win total, and there's still two games left because they've already got four losses. Like, this was this was considered a top-10 team. I think these NFL wide receivers are going to have some success against that Syracuse secondary. Uh, Syracuse, I think, is just trying to get to the finish line. Just trying to get there. I know, but the, I know my number is just under the ten here. But Wake, I think, has been embarrassed the past couple of weeks. I think they're trying to get back on track here. I like Sam Hartman to do that. Uh, give me Wake to cover the ten uh, because man, you just I don't know that you can bet on Syracuse right now. Uh, would it surprise me to see them come back and, and put up a fight? No. But, man, uh, I think it's much more reliable to bet on Wake Forest where you know that they've got the tools and the quarterback, and I don't know that Syracuse has those. So let's uh, let's roll with Wake Forest to cover the 10 there. Okay. Uh, before I jump into that, let's, uh, let's see about this. UAB heads to LSU, and LSU is favored by... 15 at this point, with a total of 52 and a half. Latest numbers at Bet US, of course. 9 p.m. Eastern Time. This one's going to be on ESPN2. Uh, by the way, don't forget, I'm going to hit my uh, NFL Super Contest picks after this. But let's go ahead and pull it up, and we'll look at some trends here. The Blazers are 5-1-1 one, one against the spread in their last seven in November. Uh, don't forget, UAB went to LSU not that long ago and, and got a win in Baton Rouge. Uh, granted, times were a little different back then. Uh, <laughs> I say not that long ago. I think it was like 20, or I think it was like 2000, maybe, 2001, something like that. Um, UAB is 8-3 and three against the spread against a team with a winning record. However, you look at what they're doing against the SEC, they are 0-5 against the spread in the last five against the SEC. They are 0-4 against the spread in their last four road games. LSU, 5-1 and one against the spread in their last six home games. They are 6-2-1 and one against the spread in the last nine games in November. They are 19-7 and seven against the spread in their last 26 following a spread loss, which they did not cover when they closed as a three-and-a-half point favorite at Arkansas last week, and yet only won by three. So let's get into the numbers. My numbers have UAB uh, only a 7.72 point underdog here. This is kind of that same situation where... You're trying to handicap motivation. You're kind of trying to play psychologist a little bit. All those different things. Dylan Hopkins came back for UAB last week, and the offense got back to looking pretty good. Um, the UAB defense had been the big problem, right? Number 91 in PPA per drive over the last five weeks, which all these stats that you see on the screen are over the last five weeks. LSU, after the Alabama win, they could not get anything going uh, on the ground against Arkansas, and they really couldn't get anything going offensively, period. Uh, do I think that UAB's defense is as good as what Arkansas has uh, in their front seven? No. No, I do not believe so. But I do think that the UAB offense can put up some points here, and for Brian Vincent, who is the UAB interim coach, who is wanting that job but has lost four games already this year, he would really like to have this feather in his cap to beat the SEC West uh, champion. But I, I just don't know that he's going to be able to get there. Uh, these numbers, by the way, again, over the last five weeks, UAB's only throwing the ball 35% of the time, 36% of the time, whatever. But uh, what I'm looking at here is Hopkins is back. And, yes, they do have McBride, the running back there, and I think they're going to be able to have some success against that LSU defensive front because LSU number 93 in PPA per rush allowed. Uh, they are number 88 in rushing explosiveness allowed, number 86 in rushing success rate allowed. I think Hopkins is going to be able to throw the ball on them. Like, I, I really do. Uh, passing explosiveness, number 13 in passing explosiveness for UAB's offense. It, LSU's defense is number 104. They allow some big plays. They don't get a lot of havoc. The number 105 in havoc rate is LSU's D. I think the biggest issue that you're going to run into is the UAB defense um, being able to slow down Jaden Daniels and company. At 15 points, it, it, it doesn't sound like a ton, 
But man, for an offense like this, I really think, I really think that UAB can stay in this ball game. I understand it's in Baton Rouge. I get it, but man, uh, the LSU don't really care about this ball game. They just don't. I think UAB is going to be able to put up some points. They'll make it very interesting in this. I think they'll end up losing by two touchdowns. Uh, give me UAB plus the fifteen here, and I know I'm going the opposite way of um, the opposite of what I did with Auburn and Western Kentucky. But the truth of the matter is, LSU does not need this game. They just got to win and get out of there. It really doesn't matter. Uh, they got Texas A&M next week. They're going to be focused on that. Like that's one a rivalry game. Two, uh, you don't want to lose that because you're you're talking about a playoff game. This is a spot where UAB has a lot more motivation than than LSU. Maybe you guys see it differently. You guys jump into the comments below. Let me know what you think on this. Um, yeah. So give me give me UAB plus the fifteen. All right. Now. Let's jump into NFL Super Contest picks for week number 11. And last week, I uh, went 4-1, and one, I want to say. Um, over the pat, nah, maybe not. Maybe it was something even better than that. Uh, I will pull it up right now, as a matter of fact, so that we can look and see. Uh, I am... Da, 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 da. So, so far on the year, I'm 68 and... That's not right. I'm 28 and 21. Yes, I went four and one last week. I went four zero oh, and one uh, the week prior. So riding an eight one and one streak over the past two weeks. So not too shabby. Um, but here are my five super contest picks for this week. I'm going with the Titans plus three tonight on Thursday night um, at the Packers. I think the Titans are the better team. Packers coming off an emotional win. I know that the Titans are having to travel a short week. Whatever. Give me the Titans plus three. Eagles minus seven. At the Colts on Sunday. Eagles team going to bounce back from a not great performance. Uh, yeah, against the Commanders. So, regardless, I, I like the Eagles to bounce back there. Colts got a big first win under Jeff Saturday. Get out of here. Get out of here. Give me the Eagles. The Bengals at the Steelers. I'm going to take the Steelers plus four here. Uh, feels like they're getting a little healthier. Feels like the offense might be clicking just a touch. Everybody's going to love the Bengals here. Uh, kind of the same situation that we had with the Steelers and the Saints last week, right? Give me the Steelers plus the four at home. Cowboys at the Vikings. Give me the Cowboys in a pick em. Cowboys were favored by one and a half at one point. It's been bet all the way down. Everybody loves the Vikings right now. Big win at Buffalo last week. I understand the Cowboys lost at the Packers. Didn't look great in overtime, etc. I like the Cowboys. I think they're going to be able to win this game even on the road. The Jets plus three at the Patriots. This Jets team would be in the playoffs today if they were, of course, happening today. Uh, I like this team, the Patriots. Uh, everybody picks the Patriots against the Jets. They just always do. Things have flipped. I like what Robert Sala's doing over there. Give me the Jets plus the three. I think they can win this game outright, but I will certainly take the points on that. So those are my picks for the NFL this week. Go check out uh, go check out Valtimary Surf Company. Go check out the uh, picks contest. Both of those are linked uh, in the description. Go and sign up for BetUS. There's a fifty dollar free play if you sign up using the link in the description below. And of course, check out the BetUS College Football Show every Tuesday and Wednesday. Next week, it's only going to be on Tuesday, uh, but it's going to be a longer show than usual. So go and check it out Tuesday, one p.m. Eastern Time. Once we get into bowl season, then we're rolling with every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Make sure that you are subscribed over there. We would certainly appreciate that. Make sure that you're subscribed right here. Like the video. Subscribe to the channel. All those different things. Of course, leave a nice five-star review on the podcast. You guys know how to do this thing. Uh, all of that stuff really supports us. I mean, I, I, I do this for free. I really do. And, uh, and I would appreciate if you would keep it growing for me because I love the community aspect of it. You guys are fantastic. I'm going to get out of here. Uh, because I got I got other things I got to do. And I'm going to do another show this afternoon to toss on this channel because I did not get to do them earlier in the week. So, with that said, let's get out of here. You guys know what to do. Go to winningcureseverything.com. Go to BetUS. Go to Valtimary Surf Company. All those different things. They help us. And, yeah, I, I, I try and help them as much as possible. So, if you could help them out, that would be wonderful. Let's get out of here. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And hopefully, all your tickets cash this week. 
Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.